Thank you for joining us on uh, Leaders in Modern Finance. My name is Peter Taylor. Uh, I've been in various uh, accounting finance leadership roles over the past 10 or so years. I've, I'm currently the corporate controller here at Purple, where we manufacture and sell a variety of comfort solutions, such as mattresses uh, and pillows, all here in the U.S., um, and all of which utilize our proprietary squishy grid you see right here <laughs> and a little, little bit behind me here. So um, uh, now for a host of reasons, uh, I sleep very good. And one of those reasons um, being my mattress, of course, I'm not saying this to try and sell anyone because as folks who know me best know, I'm just a lily accountant and couldn't, uh, you know, couldn't really sell water to a camel. So, tr but trust me, uh, it's the best mattress around, around hands down. Uh, and since working here for over three and a half years now, uh, I simply refuse to sleep on anything else. Uh, even my three-year-old daughter uh, insists on having her own purple, uh, as do all of her older siblings. Um, now, enough about my sleeping preferences. Uh, when I do get out of bed in the morning uh, and head to work, I go with a drive and with a passion for being part of first-class accounting teams, uh, equipped to add you know, tr tremendous value to the rest of the org. Um, I'm, I'm also very, a very content user of Stamply and can attest to its value and what it presents me in my current role as a controller uh, and also our accounting team in general. Uh, well, enough about me. Uh, today I have uh, the, the privilege of riding shotgun for the next little bit aside my illustrious co-host, Jack McCullough. Jack, uh, now why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and get us started. Okay, I, gee, I'm not sure I've ever been called illustrious before in my life, Peter. So uh, <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, yes, and before we begin, I do want to thank Stampley, you know, not only for allowing me to be here today, but they've been a tremendous supporter of mine and the CFO Leadership Council. And I've watched the first few of the uh, webinars that they're doing and, you know, definitely some great stuff coming out of you. So thank you and congratulations to a great start. But as Peter said, I am Jack McCullough. I am the founder and president of the CFO Leadership Council. We are a professional association for financial leaders. Uh, we have about 2000 members across North America. And our mission is simply to empower CFOs. And we do that largely through some uh, you know, great professional development programs. And also probably more importantly through the peer network. The one thing that's great about the CFO Leadership Council is the closeness and the relationships the members have with each other. They really have each other's back. They learn a lot from each other. And to me, that's kind of what it's all about. So it's a wonderful organization and I'm really proud about it. But uh, Peter, I want to, um, to sort of take this if I may. Now, you, I have not been a CFO for a little over a decade, but in my role as president of the CFO Leadership Council, I basically had a front row view to the financial leadership evolution. And, you know, candidly during COVID, the evolution has become a revolution. I think it's fair to say. It's, uh, it's been put on steroids, whatever you want it to be. But, um, you, you know, I've been using the phrase controllers of the new CFOs. When you and I were talking and when I got a feel for a lot of the things that you do, they sound remarkably like my job when I was a CFO. And so I really think, you know, a lot of CFOs talk about how strategic they are and, you know, how their job has uh, become a lot more cross-functional. And that's absolutely true, but it wouldn't be possible without world-class team around them, uh, controllers, VP of finances, and all the way through. So I'm kind of curious if we can, um, you know, have you seen any evolution in your five years working for Purple and maybe some of the things you did before on how the role of the control is changing a little bit? Uh, certainly. Um, I mean, I've, I've kind of worn the controller hat for, you know, over, you know, off and on for over about 10 different, 10 years now. And, uh, you know, every role is different, of course. Uh, but certainly um, the, the, the skills and the tools, the tool sets and, and, and the resources uh, have changed over time. I think when I first jumped into a controller role, um, you know, just the technology uh, that was a, that was available at the time didn't really lend itself to uh, much much more cross functional interaction. I guess perhaps with with uh, with uh, my that role back at the time, which wasn't really it was the CFO role, but it was a, it was like a VP of finance role. Um, but yeah, being able to um, you know scale with some of the tools. I I know in the first role that I had. 
Um, I wore that hat of not only closing the books as just a typical accountant and having that high level review, but also uh, looking and helping my boss, the VP of finance, or really the CFO to, um, you know, in, in the in the budgeting, forecasting, and planning side of things. Um, and so that was, you know, two different hats that I was that I was wearing and something that, uh, you know, at the time, everything was kind of all sitting in Excel and multiple, you know, thousands of spreadsheets here and there and piecing things together. And so working at that level was, uh, was not the, the easiest and was, um, you know, it did, didn't allow for uh, much of myself to provide analysis. It was more, instead of providing analysis, I was being uh, reactive to the, the, the issues that would come up. Uh, as time has gone on and the different tools that we have that can sit within our ERPs and take things out of uh, Excel and, and get a lot of the manual aspects out of it, that allows me as a controller uh, to provide more analysis, more review, more of the, um, and, and be more uh, proactive, I guess, in seeking out trends and, and providing a story and telling the context as opposed to just sending over some reports with, uh, with some numbers to, to, my, to my boss. And so I think that, that time that has elapsed with these new tools and these new resources that's been able to equip me to, to provide that, that analysis and tell the story adds much more value than what, what it was before, where it's um, simply just kind of pushing numbers across and, and getting a lot of the manual manual stuff. So just, just some things that I was thinking about in regards to that question. Okay, yeah, that's that's fantastic. And you mentioned automation in there a couple of times. And you know, to old squares like me, you know, why do we need to automate accounts receivable? We'll just call people and make them pay. Uh, but tell me a little about how you've used automation you know, and it used to be, you know, maybe it reduced costs, but from what I know, you use it actually as almost a competitive advantage for your company, that it's it's no longer a luxury, but it's a, a must-have. Yeah, 100%. Um, I mean, you, you've got different choices as it relates to how you want to uh, tackle it, making a process more efficient. Uh, you know, you could add, add more bodies to it. You could um, make the process cleaner, faster, stronger. Uh, but a lot of these come come with the component of being able to automate something. And, you know, we're, we're living in a time now where there's so many different tools that you can integrate into your accounting systems that will um, never mind the, the tools that you have in, in, in these modern accounting systems. Uh, but you can implement those and get get those automated. I mean, Stamply being a great example of something where you can leverage the, the use of AI to, uh, you know, assist with 80% of just the data input, something that in times past was something that you, you just, you, you, you just took it, you took it for granted the fact that you had to get all that data in the system. Uh, whereas now you've got these tools that can just not only get this data in the system, but allows you to, gives you the opportunity to, to do that 20% of stuff that, that that's, that's really your skill set that really allows you to spend the time on the stuff that requires the most attention and the most handling. Um, so automating through systems, uh, what gets me out of bed in the morning is really automating stuff, you know, through processes. I mean, I, I live and breathe in Excel, uh, all, all day long. And, and with that tool, just being able to, uh, take anything that's manual. I, you know, I hate Jack, I hate something that's hard coded in Excel. That's something that just, I see that I'm like, what Are you kidding me? Um, and so taking, taking something where I, I'm able to draw on the source data, I'm able to apply some logic in, in whatever formula, whatever you want, and then having that flow through that, that for me, that's just something that I really look forward to do. In fact, I just spent the last uh, couple of, uh, couple of days uh, getting a process aligned. We had a, we have a wonderful, uh, amazing revenue manager here in my, my current organization who, uh, who's deciding to, to go find greener pastures somewhere else. And so looking at, you know, obviously, I'm going to have to provide uh, some sort of interim transition uh, but by the time we can find someone else. And so looking at the current workload of what they have and thinking, man, this is a lot of work. I don't want to do this. How can I make this easier, faster for me? Because I, it, it's all about working smarter, not harder. I mean, my dad always taught me to work harder, but you know what? That, that only gets you so far. Um, and, and so spending all this time to, you know, revamp a spreadsheet to get it to where, you know, it's kind of push button as opposed to manually having to go into each cell, document a specific thing. 
I, that's just something I, I really live for. And as time goes on now, uh, with all the skip, the tools that we have, it's something that is, you know, we're, we're able to av avail of ourselves of, of much more of that automation. So just some thought. Yeah, no, it's interesting. And I'm guessing, and you tell me if I'm wrong, because all I actually ever do in life is make educated guesses or so it seems, but, uh, you know, during the COVID and now sort of the post COVID era, I'm thinking automation is actually more important. Is, is that a fair assumption on my part? Um, I mean, I, I, I guess I, th I think it's always been important, but just the, the change that this the COVID has has had on work streams and how teams work together and cross functionally get uh, get things done. Hundred percent. I mean, it's, it's it's something where, like for example, I'm the only one on my team that comes into the office. Uh, I don't have a I don't have a room in my house with a door that locks. And so when my little girl isn't sleeping on her purple mattress, she's banging on the door to come, you know, she's wanted, wanting to talk. And so I, with all those distractions, I can't get much done. And so it's, it's nice to come into the office, but everyone else is remote. We've got folks across the country that contribute and uh, work to get the things done here. And that, that was something that before COVID, we weren't, uh, you know, we, we were all, it was a given. Everybody would come in. And that had its own challenges and that had its own benefits. Uh, but with dealing in the automated environment that we have now and, and, the, and, the, and the new tools and the way we have to close the books in the same amount of time, but all remotely, it's something that uh, it, it definitely are challenges. And I don't have all of, I'm not going to claim to have all of the, the, the right answers and the right, the best ways of doing things, but I have found stuff that works and uh, we're, we're constantly trying to refine and get better. So. Yeah, it, well, you know, I, I just want to say, you know, no dad is a match for his precocious three-year-old daughter. And as a <laughs> guy who's been a little bit ahead of the curve with you on that, it doesn't get any better as, as you and they get older. So uh, yes, sir. kind of get used to it. But I'd love to talk also about um, analytics. And, you know, I, I think all finance teams now, they're sort of playing a kind of money ball almost, you know, that for those who don't know, is a movie about baseball and how uh, they... A, a low market team revolutionized the game by just using superior data analytics. And, the and Oakland A's, correct? That is correct. Yeah, uh, in, indeed it was. So a uh, great movie if you haven't seen it. I somehow think you probably have. But tell me a little about how you're using analytics to, you know, empower your team to make better decisions and, and basically give more meaningful information. For sure. So fortunately we have, so we utilize a, a closed management software tool that lends itself to providing us analytics, uh, you know, at a push button. Like we can go in there and see specific dashboards that shows us, you know, for example, as we're going through our close, currently we do an eight day close. Uh, and we've got all of our specific tasks to complete this closed outlined and defined within this closed management software. And each of those tasks each of those tasks we, that we find has a specific due date, a specific reviewer and, and preparer and that type of thing. And so we're able to run dashboards to show us, okay, what are those pain points? What are, what are the, the, the issues, the areas that are cause, were related, that, that are constantly, you know, over the, if we look over the past four to six months, what are those areas that are constantly causing us the most headaches and the most pain and that are, you know, crossing deadlines all of the time. We can, those things will jump out to us, seeing those analytics there. So that's having that tool is something that's that's invaluable as, as we look and review at the close, because as we do a debrief and postmortem on the close, we can and we can look and decide, okay, what changes structurally can we make to you know streamline this better for next month? Are there any dependencies that we can document in there to ensure that you know people aren't waiting specifically for the for those for those things downstream and, and, and can can get a jump. So have it, that closed management software is definitely in those those analytics that are provided through those dashboards are key in helping us structure the close. We're actually looking to go from an eight uh, to a five day close here by the end of this year. Uh, we're on target and we we have without these analytics and these dashboards that we have, we would not have been able to kind of reshuffle and make the those changes by, you know, bringing on additional resources or shifting certain tasks yep, to other individuals, we wouldn't have been able to do that have, without having that high-level anal analytic view. So there's one example. Yeah, that's not easy to do in a manufacturing type of environment. I mean, some businesses, it's a little bit easier. But I'm, I'm kind of curious, do you, um, 
do you use traditional gap accounting more often or do you rely more on KPIs and other kind of analytics in doing your job and making decisions? Yeah, so currently in currently in my role, uh, I'm 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 a little more siloed into just just the gap. So we have just our specific accounting function. We've got a whole function that that sits analytics that does business intelligence and provides kind of executive level dashboards for uh, for our management team. And so I've I'm a little bit out of that in my current role, but I've definitely worn that hat in the past and love structuring those you know KPIs and getting those kind of set up. I mean we of course, have our own KPIs that we utilize out of that closed management software and can pull. Uh, there's other KP, you know, there's other customizable KPIs that each one of our functional groups will look at. You know, for example, um, our AR and AP teams, uh, we we can run specific queries that kind of pull the data that help, you know, provide the the context of what are the success, you know, how, first let's define the success and then how can we measure that. And so establishing those KPIs and measuring those, that, that's something that kind of each group does. We could always do better, especially, especially in my area, which is primarily the GL and closing that out. It's more nebulous and it's more uh, something that's not necessarily tracked, but we can, we definitely have stuff that we're, we're using to track. And it's, it's very helpful and useful in, in making the decisions as to how to, to make it better next month. Okay, that's fantastic. I'd love to chat a little bit about leadership and, you know, the, in the old days, financial leadership almost wasn't a thing, right? It was very much a, a, a behind the desk, back office type of job, but that's not changed. Uh, that has changed, excuse me. So tell me about your role as a controller, it, it, but but more than that, as one of the respected leaders in your group and, and maybe cross-functionally as well. Yeah, no, I, I, I like to, I like to lead by example in the sense that I'm not, I'm not going to do any, I'm not going to request something of someone else that I'm not willing to do myself. And so I've, I've never been leery of working in the weeds. I mean, to be honest, without that deep dive and jumping in and getting down to the transactional workflow level, I, I really, without that understanding, I can't, as a leader, I can't add value. I can't provide, um, you know, advice or, 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 you know, direction on how we could look at something or or be able to define define the analysis that, that comes out of specific process. So I, I I really believe you know that we as finance leaders need to lead by example and not be afraid to to jump into the weeds. And that's kind of something that I've that I've uh, taken to heart. Another uh, another way you know myself as a leader I you know I have the I have the word controller in my title and I love explaining that to my kids. They're always like. Well, you like control everything, Dad. What does that mean? I mean, you 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 don't you know, they, they they just get this idea with the name that I'm really just heavy handed and and <laughs> want, you know control everything. And it's it's funny because I I personally I like to equip my team for success. I I you know everybody's different. You know some people just want a specific set of instructions and head down and get a process done. Uh, you need to learn to be able to adapt to specific uh, learning styles. Uh, but I personally like to, you know, equip the folks on my team to give them all the tools that they need to get something done. I, I don't necessarily feel like I have to control everything. I, if anything, I want to I want to hand out the, and delegate uh, those responsibilities so that folks get their job done. They don't have to come to me always and, you know, get, you know, get permission or this or that. I mean, obviously, there's segregation of duties and whatnot. But but beyond beyond that, I, I like to let People have what they need to get their job done. And if they want to use their wings and fly, or if they just want to stay where they're at, that's, that's where you're at. And for me, having as a leader, that's generally lent itself to, you know, folks that will uh, want to perhaps go to a different part of the organization, perhaps want to take a different role, maybe go somewhere else. But to be honest, I, I don't want folks on my team that are kind of just, you know, stuck and, and the ambition isn't there really to learn and to grow. I want folks that that want to look elsewhere and that want to learn more and that want to take the tools that they have and get their job done. So that's those are just two uh, two components of leadership that I that I've always taken to heart. Yeah, so you're a, a classic lead by example and whatnot. So, uh, but one thing that I've observed, and you know, people who aren't in our line of work, you know, find it odd, but 
most leaders, even CFOs and controllers, have a high emotional IQ. In fact, I'd argue that at the leadership level, an emotional IQ is equally important to the traditional IQ. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Would you agree, disagree? I mean, as far as emotional IQ, I mean, I, 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 I guess just from the context, I can understand perhaps what it, what it means, but maybe define it a little bit more as far as where you, you're coming from with your use of that term. Sure. If a person has a, an emotional IQ, they have the ability to um, understand other people. It, it, you know, it, it, that your accounting manager isn't just an accounting manager. He or she is a husband, wife, parent, child. You know, a, yeah. they have their own parents, whatever it might be. So you can understand the full person. And you also are cognizant of your own presence. The things that they're aware that you're aware that things that you do as a leader impact other people in subtle ways that may not be obvious to you, yet they still do. That's, I mean, that's not a textbook definition, but within a no, business no. context. So. Yeah, that's helpful. No, it's it's something that, I mean, I, I strive, I've been striving since since uh, jumping into these managerial roles and, and finance and accounting teams to, to achieve that. And it's something that I'm I'm learning and striving for each 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 week as I come into work. Um, I find that you do connect the more connection you have with your team and the individuals on the team, the stronger cohesion you're going to feel as a team um, getting together for activities, getting together for lunches. We, you know, as much as we try, you know, since we're dispersed across the country, we're, you know, rarely do we get opportunities to kind of come together, but a lot of times that just means just having a zoom meeting where we can all just sit down and chat uh, one-on-ones or something that's, that's a key component and something that you try and, uh, leverage and you know, technology is helpful. Uh, it's it's nice for us to kind of chat like this, but it, it's even better when you're in person um, and you can uh, take those subtle cues and, and learn and just and have that personal personal touch. Is it, it, it's it's unfortunate that we've uh, we're lacking a little bit in that, but um, having that emotional IQ is is key because I've seen controllers that don't have it, and believe me. A lot of the words that I hear from some of those teams anecdotally, you know, you hear the word toxic a lot of times where when that's lacking, it's it's something where I, I think folks don't, um, when they think of the prospect of getting out of bed to go to work in the morning, it kind of gives a, 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 sick, a sick feeling in their stomach and that bleeds over into the work that's provided and, and the work that's, and the quality of work that comes. And so <clears throat> focusing on that, like you say, I, that's, probably more important than anything else that you could provide as, uh, as a leader in your, in your accounting finance role and something that is only going to get more important as, as, uh, as time goes on. So, yeah. 100%. You know, there's a, there's sort of a debate about leadership, you know, can you become a better leader or are you sort of, you know, by around your 18th birthday, are you the leader that you're going to be? It sounds like you've actually, and I kind of think it's not a much of a debate, but but it, it sounds like you've actually worked hard to become a better and more uh, a better leader. And, you know, even if you, you didn't think of emotional IQ to develop a further emotional IQ, is that fair to say? Yeah, hundred percent. And that's, yeah. And I, I strive and, and it's, it's something like I, like I said, I think without having that component, you're going to get teams that just don't connect and don't, um, don't feel like a, a, a team working together that have the same goal in mind and that, and that have a passion to come together and work. So, yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Well, before we uh, went on the air, you had suggested that we talk about what you called uh, gold standards that remain. And uh, I'd like to, I think we have time. Can we go through all five and I'd love to just get your thoughts on, yeah, certainly. you know, why you've identified them as the gold standard. I'll just read them in the order you gave them to me, but, uh, and you know, they make a lot of sense to me clearly defined and documented processes. Yes. Um, having things documented, you know, as far starting off my career in public accounting, I quickly learned that if something wasn't documented, it really never happened. Um, <laughs> and, and so the approach I take now, as I uh, look at, uh, you know, all the tasks that we have to, you know, whether they're daily tasks or tasks for closing, uh, closing our books, um, if we don't have that documented, 
properly. And if it's not to the point where an independent third party could come in and reasonably perform all the specific steps and then document it themselves, it's, it's really not there. Um, so this is, this is one thing that I, I just, I have a passion for making sure that <clears throat> teams are equipped to do exactly that process. We never, I mean, I never know. I'm, I'm going to get hit by a bus. There's a whole bunch of stuff that I do that my boss needs to be aware of. How is he going to know what, what, what it is that I do? And so I, I make it, I, I make it a, a goal of mine for all, like I mentioned this closed management software that we utilize. And so I look at all of my tasks that I, you know, specific tasks close or daily tasks. And I make sure that every single one of those has, a, you know, for example, just kind of a high level understand explanation of what it is, you know, just a couple sentence, one sentence, a couple sentences. It has, you know, just to provide some context, it has a link to a screen share where anyone can click on that. It'll pull up a screen share of walking through specific steps of whatever reports are pulled or where things are placed, uh, what, what is done. Um, from start to finish. And then if this tool allows us to upload that specific support, that evidence for that task that was done. And so it provides all that context all in one. Every single one of my tasks has to have that gold standard, hundred percent right on, right off the bat. And so that's for me. And I take great pride in that as the controller, I'm always trying to uh, work to get the rest of the team up to speed. That's that's the standard that we want to work for. And so the rest of the team is working to get to that level of, you know, there's the task, let's click on the link. Oh, I can watch and see, you know, a lot of times there are longer recordings than someone would like, and you can actually overlay audio of folks talking through a process of, of analysis that they perform and who they need to talk to in the organization to get stuff and what emails are sent back and forth. And so having that all documented, Without it, as far as I'm concerned, I, it, it never really got done. And that's that's uh, that's the end of the story. So Fair enough. well, I certainly hope you don't get hit by a bus, you know, for reasons <laughs> other than, 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 than the types you discussed. But uh, but you're building on that a little bit. And I think that was great. But you also uh, mentioned that clearly defined roles and responsibilities. And in particular, you were thinking of when you're implementing technology that's cross-functional, not just within the world of finance and accounting. So talk a little about that, if you would. Yeah, especially when implementing things. I think a lot of times we we forget that a specific tool is going to, who, who the stakeholders are going to be. A lot of times we, I, I've made the mistake of thinking, okay, this is just a, this is just something that we're implementing here in accounting and finance and is going to help us with the close, but don't think of the stakeholders and or the the consumers of the, the the data or the output that we're going to get and and look at their considerations and, and look at how this this tool might affect their you know their day-to-day -day work uh work schedule and what they may have to do and so making sure that you're communicating 100 percent all the time especially when implementing new processes is key getting everybody uh you know what whatever that looks like to you and every 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 one of these implementations is going to look different uh, but making sure that everybody's on that, that number one, you identify who these groups are, uh, that you get their buy-in, that you get their input, um, and, and really learn to listen. It's it's enough to it's it's not enough to just explain you know the context, the drive, and what value it's going to be added, but really listen to what pain points they may they may be feeling and how we in accounting and how this process could help them track their success better and, and whatever that is. And, and maybe look at perhaps uh, things that will make their job, uh, that might prevent them from getting their uh, tasks done properly. A lot of times implementing a new project is gonna make their, their jobs, uh, instead of easier, it may make it more difficult. Uh, so making sure there's communication that we're listening and then having stand-up meetings, whatever that looks like. But that, that, that's key is identifying those different groups and then making sure there's, a, there's constant communication and, and, and and without that, it's, I think a lot of times those implementations are bound to fail. Yeah, well, you, you reminded me of uh, the art of war. Every battle is, is uh, won or lost before it's fought. 
Yeah. It, it sounds like there's something to be learned from that, right? I mean, if you do a lot of the upfront work with the communications and planning, if you fail to do that, it seems like you're probably going to lose anyway, right? Yeah. And, and you mentioned planning. I mean, that's that's super key. Um, I mean, I, think, <laughs> I know from in a personal on a personal side, like whenever we plan, uh, we we just we just got a travel trailer, and it's something that where uh, I hate planning uh, traveling. Uh, I like to just you know get up one day and oh let's go here, honey type thing. Um, but when you're taking around, uh, you you end up paying for the fact that you don't uh, plan. Uh, whatever that looks like, you may get somewhere and there's no available spots for you, uh, or you forgot to you know bring a host of tools that were required for your uh, propane heating system to work, which incidentally happened uh, last week for me. Uh, Definitely. I, I that's an trailer. oddly specific example, but I guess if it happens, so. Yes. Yeah. Don't take your travel trailer out in the wintertime without making sure and planning for uh, your heater to be working properly. So, yeah, <laughs> that's a solid tip, I think. So cool. But I, I wanted to chat also, you mentioned about um, business policies and practices and uh, how they need to be aligned and even updated where applicable. What, uh, what can we learn from you about that? Yeah. You know, people here, policies and procedures and those type of things. And a lot of people just feel those are like kind of cuss words. And, and, and in accounting, we have, we, you know, we live and die by those, uh, unfortunately. And it's with the organization, making sure that those are communicated properly uh, is, is really key. In our role is start safeguarding the, you know, that the financial well-being of the company. That's, that's something that, that we need to make sure the rest of the organization has, uh, understands how important those are. Um, and a lot of times that, that requires the management to communicate that down to the rest, you know, add a little extra muscle as opposed to just the controller saying something. Um, but really it's key to make sure those are, those are updated. I and mean, we, we look at, we look at all of our accounting policies at, at least annually once. Um, and that's something that we want to do to uh, make sure we're in line. It's, it's a review that we have to get, we have to do to ensure that, uh, you know, I mean, time, times change. And so what one capitalization threshold was uh, a year or two ago, maybe we want to change that and, and bring in the different parties. Do we want to up the threshold to, you know, 10,000? What, what would that do? What would that affect being and making sure that we're looping in uh, our tax folks and looping in our engineers and, and, and making sure everybody kind of understands what that might mean. But Looking at different policies, it's is something that's super key for us. Uh, you know, we're <clears throat> we're a direct to consumer manufacturer, so it's it's not super. You know, our balance sheet isn't super complex, um, and so you know we don't really have too many complex revenue recognition issues that we have to deal with from a revenue recognition policy. But it's really key to get those established. Uh, there are ones that that do have a little more nuance. And, and, you know, we're, we're establishing right now just uh, like, for example, here, uh, some specific policies around uh, certain warranties on certain products that we're doing that those have a very long lead time because it's tied to a specific product release. And so making sure that all the parties are engaged and we understand uh, the specifics of a, of a product and what what and how the customer support team is going to go to make sure that those are, that we take care of our customers. It, it really requires a long lead time and, and making sure that we have that set up. So uh, 100%, you got to keep those top of mind, no matter how boring it is to write a policy or review those each month. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And I want to go back your uh, your leadership instincts with this, but I, I've heard the phrase upskilling quite a bit lately. And the idea is just, you know, bringing your team up to speed, keeping them on the cutting edge of modern practices, but you talked a little about just making sure that everybody's properly equipped with training, experience, skills. Shed a little about but your philosophy on that, if you would. Yeah. Um, I mean, like I said, equipping our team, my team for success is key, but there, there's also, it, it's a tricky, it, it's a tricky line because I, I want to, to make sure, you know, in, in my role specifically, I, I don't, I don't want to, there's, there's a little bit of handholding, but I don't want to handhold too much where someone's going to maybe get used to that and they're not going to be able to let their wings and, and 
spread their wings and, 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 and run with a specific role. So for, for me, yes, overall training, we've, we equip all of our folks with, um, when they get on the job day one, making sure that they're, that they're, uh, up to speed on all the different tools that we we utilize. Um, but for certain tasks, I kind of expect, instead of just like a, a general training, more of a one-on-one -on -one behind the shoulder. I know for me personally, I learn a heck of a lot more when someone's over my shoulder, you know, showing me, hey, this is, this is that, certain instances. Um, and so that's <clears throat> learning to adapt, but having every one of those components, kind of a general training, uh, and then individual specific training, that's really key. And then back to the whole documentation that we we, we talked about earlier, having that already uh, assigned to a specific task and certain desk procedures of someone, you know, if, if, if I'm not there for the day and we're cross training on a specific task, they can just click on something and watch and see how, how somebody goes through and analyzes and performs a specific procedure. So yes, it's key. Um, but with the understanding that everybody learns differently and being able to be in a position to adapt to that, I think is, uh, is key. Cool. And then your final gold standard was around the control environment, specifically as it relates to proper data capture. And you seem like a, a, the, a little bit of a data guy. So, you know, talk to us about what your philosophy on that is, if you would. Data, yeah. I mean, we've, <coughs> they, everyone, Everyone comes to me as like the specific guru of our accounting system. I get a lot of questions, which is great. I love it. Um, I've learned to utilize specific uh, searching queries within this, the system that we utilize. And, and I've, I find it to be very beneficial. I, I love to be the guy that someone comes to, to, to draft a specific query to come up with some reports. And the tool, that, and the, tool the financial accounting software that we utilize is very easy for a, a non-software uh, developer guy like me to, to drum up the, that kind of analysis and those types of reports. So I love being that guy. I'm fine with it. Um, and equipping everybody on the team to be able to do that analysis themselves, that's, that's something where it's a little bit different. A lot of people are scared by jumping in and defining you know, logic statements and defining the different criteria and statements and fields that will we'll get drawn up, but um, overall, just being able to uh, have that ability, it kind of lends itself to what I talked about before by leading leading by example. I, I, I have no problem going in and, and there's a specific problem, here's the solution, and then equipping the, equip, equipping the team with that ability to go in and have that query that I created, they, they can utilize, and then giving them the tools to, hey, if something comes up and we need to rerun this for a different time period or for a different dimension, here's how you go in and change that and documenting that and, and letting someone jump with that. That's, that's really ultimately how it works. We're, we're fortunate enough here uh, at Purple to have our own analytics group that really <clears throat> sits on top of all of the accounting systems and, and really provides those executive level dashboards and really all of the data uh, to our management at that level. And so it's, we're fortunate that, that we've got these experts that are able to leverage that. But as far as uh, our accounting system and running that, that's um, that, that's something that I, I really love doing is pulling data from there and getting it to the point where there's not a lot of manual uh, massaging to the data, really just configure the searches so that we can drop it in, run our analysis, whatever that whatever that may be, and uh, having it go a lot faster than just reviewing one by one manually, something I, th those are my cuss words, manual and hard code, yeah. Those are your cuss words, that's as bad as it gets for you. Uh, <laughs> I'll hold back because this is probably a PG type of crowd out of respect, <laughs> but I just have one final question for you, sir. Certainly. Uh, how do I get your mattresses? You had me sold uh, right at the beginning of the program and I didn't want to forget to ask. Yeah, so here, like as as I was showing you, this is the the, the squishy grid. Uh huh. Hits all your pressure points. It's it's amazing. Uh, um, purple dot com. Uh, all all the great uh, great deals are there. We've got some amazing sales coming up here with Black Friday. Uh, I think those sales start next week. But uh, it's it's an amazing bed. There are various different uh, uh, beds for different. You know, some like it firm, some like it soft. 
So you're able to check that out. You can go to any, we've got various stores across the country. I think we're opening, you mentioned uh, you're in Boston, is that correct? Massachusetts. I'm a little, I'm closer to New Hampshire, but yeah, the general area. Yeah. So I, I think we're opening up a store in Somerville, if that's anywhere near you. Yeah, I used to live there actually. It's a fun, so, so, fun place. So, so yeah, that, that store should be opening here pretty soon. So cool. John, yeah, I'm actually there and, uh, check it out. Good stuff. But uh, and you said purple.com. That's a little surprising that that would be like available. So uh, yeah, it's well, it, it it wasn't uh, it wasn't cheap. Let's put it that. The oh, fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. Anyway, uh, this has been a fun conversation, and I'd like to think an invaluable one. Uh, so Leaders of Modern Finance is the name of the program. Uh, Peter, this was terrific. I you know, like to think our audience learned a lot from your expertise. And I want to thank Stampley again for giving us this opportunity and putting the series together and basically just for your support of CFOs and controllers around the globe. Mm-hmm.